Above the Napa Valley, off the Silverado Trail, I turn the car onto Sanatorium Road, which leads to the hospital. Nick looks at the sign, shakes his head, and Riley remarks, Great. Therapy camp. Here we go again. I park the car and see Nick looking over his shoulder. He's thinking of making a run for it. Don't you dare. I'm scared, all right? Jesus, he says. This is going to be a nightmare. Compared to getting beaten up and almost killed? Yeah. We enter the main building and follow the signs to the substance abuse program. We take an elevator to the second floor, and from there walk down a corridor. In contrast with Olaf Recovery, this is a sterile hospital. Gray carpeting, fluorescent light, endless hallways, nurses in white, orderlies in blue. We sit on a pair of upholstered chairs near a busy nurse's station, filling out forms. We don't talk. Then a nurse with a Harpo Marx hairdo and large pink glasses comes for Nick. She explains that he will be interviewed and undergo a physical examination before he is admitted. To me, she says, It will take about an hour. He'll meet you here. Karen and I go downstairs to the hospital gift shop and from the meager selection buy him a few toiletries. When we return, Nick says that it's time for him to go to his room. We walk with him a little way down the corridor. He holds on to my arm. He feels almost weightless, as if he could lift from Earth. We all awkwardly hug. Good luck, I say. Take care of yourself. Thanks, Papa. Thanks, KB. I love you, Karen says. I love you too. He looks at me and says, Everything. Tears flow. The program at St. Helena is similar to the one at Count Olaf's, though it includes more exercise with yoga and swimming in the hospital's kidney-shaped pool, plus consultations with staff physicians and a psychiatrist. It emphasizes education, with lectures and films about the brain chemistry of addiction and daily AA and NA meetings, plus an expanded two-day-a-week family program. At this point, I'm not saying when about rehab, but I allow myself a sliver of hope. As in the Springsteen song, at the end of every hard-earned day, people find some reason to believe. Mine is a mix of this hope and, once again, tenuous relief because I know where he is. At home I sleep, though unsoundly. In my nightmares, Nick is on drugs. I rage at him. I plead with him. I weep for him. Hi, he does not care. Hi, he stares back blankly and coldly. Other people visit the wine country for its Cabernet and Pinot Noir, mud baths, and good food. Karen and I make pilgrimages for family weekends at the hospital. Before our first St. Helena session, a counselor tells me that an addict's prognosis is far better when his or her family participates. We worry most about ones without families, she says. Nick is one of the lucky ones. You will find Nicholas greatly changed, she remarks as we walk down a wide hallway. But he's feeling pretty depressed. They all do when they're detoxing, and meth is the worst. Family sessions at the hospital are structured differently than at Count Olaf's. We first gather in a large room with lines of chairs facing a lectern and TV monitors. The hospital offers four education forums on alternating Sundays. Our first is on the disease model of addiction. This is an alien concept for me. What other diseases include, as a symptom, the willing participation of the victim? Each time Nick does speed, he makes a choice, doesn't he? Smokers may bring on their lung cancer, but otherwise, cancer patients are not responsible for their condition. Drug addicts are, aren't they? The lecturer explains that addiction is genetic, at least the predisposition to addiction. That is, Nick's genes are partly to blame, the potent mix of his ancestry. My dark-complexioned forebears, Russian Jews, mixed with his mother's fair Southern Methodists. Vicky's father died of alcoholism, so we didn't have to look far in the family tree, though no one really knows exactly how the predisposition is passed down. Roughly 10% of people have it, the speaker says. If they do, drugs or alcohol activates the disease. A switch is turned on, she says. Once it's activated, it cannot be deactivated. Pandora's box cannot be closed. A man interrupts. You're letting people off the hook, he says. No one forced my son to go to his drug dealer, to score, to cook up meth, to inject heroin, to rob us, to rob a liquor store, and his grandparents. No, she answers. No one did. He did it himself. But nonetheless, he has an illness. It's a tricky illness. 
Yes, people do have choices about what to do about it. It's the same with an illness like diabetes. A diabetic can choose to monitor his insulin levels and take his medication. An addict can choose to treat his disease through recovery. In both cases, if they don't treat their illnesses, they worsen and the person can die. But, the same man interjects, a diabetic does not steal, cheat, lie. A diabetic doesn't choose to shoot up heroin. There's evidence that people who become addicted, once they begin using, have a type of compulsion that cannot be easily stopped or controlled, she says. It's almost like breathing. It's not a matter of willpower. They cannot just stop on their own or they would. No one wants to be an addict. The drug takes a person over. The drug, not a person's rational mind, is in control. We teach addicts how to deal with their illness through ongoing recovery work. It's the only way. People who say they can control it don't understand the nature of the disease, because the disease is in control. No, I think. Nick is in control. No, Nick is out of control. After the presentation, there are questions and answers. Then we meet in another room. We sit in a circle of chairs, another circle. We are becoming used to these surreal circular gatherings of parents and children and significant others of addicts. We take turns introducing ourselves, sharing abridged versions of our stories. They are all different. Different drugs, different lies, different betrayals, but the same, dreadful and heartbreaking, all laced with intense worry and sadness and palpable desperation. We are dismissed for lunch to dine with our family member and the program. Nick wanders shakily down a hallway toward us. He's pallid, moving slowly, as if each step causes searing pain. He seems genuinely happy to see us. He gives us warm hugs, holding on to each of us for a long time. His cheek presses against mine. We choose sandwiches wrapped in plastic and pour coffee into plastic mugs and carry them on trays to an empty bench outside on the balcony. After taking a bite of his sandwich and then pushing it away, Nick explains his lassitude. He has been given sedatives to aid in the come-down process. He says that the medication is distributed twice each day by Nurse Ratched. He impersonates Lewis Fletcher, and one flew over the cuckoo's nest. If Mr. McMurphy doesn't want to take his medication orally, he says, with a drawl accompanied by a menacing look, I'm sure we can arrange that he can have it some other way. He chortles, but it's a weak performance. He's too sedated to put much verve into it. After lunch, he shows us his room, with twin single beds and nightstands and a small round table with two chairs. It looks comfortable, like a modest hotel room. Indicating the bed by one wall, he tells us about his roommate. He's a great guy, Nick says. He was a chef, a drunk. He's married with a baby. Look, he picks up a photograph in a bamboo frame on the bedside table. An angelic baby girl around two years old and her mother, a beauty with a churned-up sea of yellow curls and a light-filled smile. She told him this is his last chance, Nick says. If he doesn't stay sober, she'll leave him. On Nick's bedside table is the Alcoholics Anonymous Big Book and a stack of recovery literature. There is a small closet and a dresser into which he stashed the small pile of his folded clothes we brought along. Next, he guides us onto the balcony, which looks out over vineyards. I'm so sorry about everything, he blurts. I look at Karen. We do not know what to say, 